Welcome. I'm Michelle Larson, the president and CEO of the Adler Planetarium, and excited to welcome everybody here tonight for our Kavli Full Dome Lecture. Um, this is an evening where we get to celebrate um, frontier science and science communication. How do we invite you all into the process that is understanding the universe around us? And we are delighted that you're here to go on that journey with us. As you see, or ha did see, on the globe that was spinning on the front, we are not only broadcasting this live here in Chicago at the Adler Planetarium, but we are also all around the globe. Um, tonight, we are in 15 cities in three different countries where they will be experiencing the same lecture with the same visuals on their planetarium domes or via a virtual reality stream through YouTube 360. Because of time zone challenges around our big globe, we will be doing this all over again tomorrow at noon, and we will have another 10 cities in five countries joining us tomorrow. So on the globe behind us earlier, you saw a total of 25 cities in six countries that are participating in this lecture, as well as all of our partners everywhere that are able to view it via YouTube 360. So thank you for being a part of this global event. How is this possible? How do we have the ability to think about coordinating global partners for this type of an event? Well, we have that capability because we have a visionary partner, and that's the Kavli Foundation. So we, this is our sixth Kavli Full Dome Lecture. And four years ago, when we started this, we had the great privilege of the Kavli Foundation seeing with us what this could be before we even got started. And so Jim Cohen is with us tonight. He flew in from California, where the Kavli Foundation is located. And we thank Jim and the Foundation for seeing that this was possible and for being here tonight. OK, so now let me introduce our speaker, um, Shane Larson. Dr. Shane Larson is our speaker tonight. Shane is a research professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University. He is also the associate director of Sierra, which is a research center for interdisciplinary astrophysics. Shane is a fellow in the American Physical Society, which is the professional society of physicists. And less than one half of 1% of the membership is inducted into being a fellow each year. And the reason I mention that is because I'd like to read you the citation on his fellowship, because I think it gives you a real preview into what you're in for tonight. His citation is that Shane Larson is a fellow of the American Physical Society for impacting science and society through the integration of public engagement and research, and for empowering generations of future scientists by his example. So Shane is a gravitational wave physicist. He studies gravitational waves predicted by Einstein 100 years ago and just discovered in the last two years by a ground-based observatory called LIGO. He also works on a space-based gravitational wave observatory called LISA, which is a NASA European Space Agency collaboration. And He's quite good at Lego, since he likes four-letter acronyms. And so I can attest to the fact that he has built models of both Lego and Lisa in Lego. So just a little insight into Shane. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shane Larson, our speaker tonight. OK. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Michelle. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It's certainly a great pleasure to have you here under the dome with us at Adler and all of you who are joining us via simulcast as well. Um, as a professional scientist, it's always a great privilege to have the opportunity to come out and talk to you about things that are near and dear to my heart, and you'll hear some of those things tonight. Uh, but we also love this opportunity just to be able to come out and tell you about the things that we're confused about, the things that we're thinking about, the things that we're discovering. Hopefully teach you something new, give you something you can go home and talk to your family and your friends about, and by the end of the night tonight, give you an opportunity to ask some questions about things that you may wonder, things you may not understand, things you may can be confused about, or something you've just always wanted to know. And so we'll do all of that tonight as part of this story that I'm going to tell you. And the story I want to tell you tonight is just one small part of a much larger story. But it's about how we've come to understand and how, over the course of a single human life, we change our understanding of the immense size and the immense age of the universe. 
So when we talk about the universe, it begins by looking at the sky, and we describe the cosmos using numbers, and often enormous numbers. We say things like, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, a hundred million times older than the oldest human who has ever lived. When you look at the night sky, like you see it on the dome here above us, there are some 10,000 individual stars that you can see with your naked eye. But all told, the Milky Way, which you see arching over your head there, contains 400 billion individual stars. And if you and I could somehow take a road trip, traveling at the speed of light, the fastest speed possible in the universe, it would take us 100,000 years, a 1,000 times longer than the human lifetime, to travel from one side of that Milky Way to the other. And that isn't even very far in the universe. Now, factoids like that are great, right? They melt your brain. They're fun to talk to your family about over barbecue. But the thing that amazes me the most about numbers like that is that even though they're so huge, you and I occupy just a very small corner in space and just the briefest moment of time in all of cosmic history. And we can still discover all the things about how big the universe is and about everything that we think may have happened to it over the course of its long life. In the briefest moment of time in cosmic history, as we said in the title, and just a heartbeat in the age of the cosmos, the lifetime of a single human, how we understand the sky above us changes dramatically. And so that's the story that I want to take you on tonight. And so I'll tell it to you through my story. My love affair with the night sky began, like many of us, in my backyard when I was young, when I was in elementary school. Yeah, look at me. I look just like I do now, right? So when I was in elementary school, I would lay out in my backyard. I had an old beat up paper star wheel that I would use to learn my constellations, trying to map the sky above my head. And we didn't have a telescope, but my mom was an avid birder. And so she had a little spotting scope that you see up there. She still has it. And she used to let me take it out at night and put it on a card table. And I would use it to look at things in the sky. And what it showed me is that with just a little bit of technology at, the, at my disposal, it transformed the way I could see and understand the universe. I would look at things like the moon. And when I look at the moon, even with that spotting scope, I could see mountains and craters and sinuous canyons. I would look at other points of light in the sky and discover that they weren't points of light at all. They were the planet Mars, or the planet Jupiter, or the planet Saturn. All things that you can't see unless you had a piece of technology. If you look up over your left shoulders here, near the back of the dome, there's a fuzzy patch of light. Okay? It looks like a wisp of cloud, but it's not a cloud at all. It's actually the most distant object you can see with your naked eye. It's called the Andromeda Galaxy. And it's the nearest galaxy to us that is like our own Milky Way. It is a vast and swirling maelstrom of gas and dust and stars that through even the tiniest spotting scope looks dramatically different and intriguing and mysterious. Now, the thing about Andromeda is it's 2.1 million light years away, which means if you and I go out tonight and we look at Andromeda, the light that comes into our eyes and makes this impression on our brains is ancient light. It left the Andromeda galaxy 2.1 million years ago, at a time long before humans and our civilization was here, when the planet Earth was different than it was today, when the things roaming around this part of the world were megafauna like saber-toothed tigers and mastodons. Okay? But that light has been traveling across the universe until it reached us just this night tonight. And this is one of the fundamental truths about astronomy that we're going to rely on tonight. Looking at the night sky is like using a time machine. The way we discern the story of the universe history is we look out into the night sky, and the farther out we look, the farther back in time we look. And we can use that to help us understand how the universe has changed and evolved. So let's talk about how we use that and how we have used it over the course of a single life. So let's go back to the beginning. 
of my career in astronomy, my professional career in astronomy in 1988. Uh, my career as an amateur astronomer was still evolving. I had upgraded from my mom's spotting scope. I had built my own telescope. This was my first telescope. It's an eight inch reflecting telescope. Uh, it has since passed uh, down the line in my family to my daughter. She now owns it. Okay, so it's still out there doing astronomy, which is another thing we'll have tonight. Um, and at the same time that I was working out in the backyard, astronomers were also working with their own big telescopes. In 1988, the largest telescope in the world was the 5-meter or 200-inch Hale telescope on Mount Palomar, which you see projected on the dome here above you. Now, here in the dome, this is a little bit larger than life-size, but this is very close to what it would look like if you stand directly under it in the dome on Mount Palomar. It's an enormous machine for gathering faint light from far away in the cosmos and helping us gather it so that we can use it to understand the universe around us. Now, on any given night, most of us, whether we're professional astronomers or amateur astronomers, when we go out and we look at the night sky, it looks much like it did the night before. The sky doesn't change dramatically night to night. The stars are still where you saw them last night. The galaxy is still there. And so in many ways, we are looking at the universe, and we don't worry that it's changed from the last time we looked at it. The sky is very big, so we haven't looked everywhere. And of course, there is plenty to see. But the things that interest us very often the most are things that are very sudden and very transient. Dramatic events that happen in a very quick moment of time, even to us as humans, and are very different from everything else that we see in the sky. Today, in this time and age, we know something about the way stars live their lives. And one of the things we know that happens is stars, when they reach the end of their lives, they die and in an explosion called a supernova. And the last supernova in the Milky Way galaxy that occurred was in 1604. Now, that was before the invention of telescopes. But nonetheless, it was an important enough event in uh, the history of astronomy that it was noted down in the records of the day. And so what you see here behind me is an astrolabe from the Adler Collection. And some of you may have seen it out here before the lecture started, but it will also be available after the lecture for those of you here in Chicago with us. And if you look up there in the upper right, there is a star marked on the astrolabe that is not a star at all. It's actually the supernova recorded where it was in the sky and marked on the astrolabe so that people would have an opportunity to remember and talk about the fact that the sky was changing. Now, if you talk to our historian, Pedro, who was out there with us about this uh, before the lecture, he will tell you that this is significant because this represents a time when we didn't know what these things were. We didn't know what supernovas were. And so the fact that we were recognizing that they were part of the things that go on in the night sky and not in the atmosphere above the Earth is significant. If you spool forward 400 years, then we begin to look for these things in the uh, uh, modern age. But we've never seen one in the Milky Way in those 400 years. But in 1987, there was a supernova very close to us. Right now, you and I are immersed in the large Magellanic Cloud. It is a small satellite galaxy very near to the Milky Way. And if you and I lived there and could look at the night sky, we would look out into the sky and see our own Milky Way galaxy hanging there over our heads as this bright, fuzzy cloud in the sky. And on the 23rd of February, 1987, there was a star in the LMC that supernova And when it exploded, it threw out into the universe a vast cloud of light, which we, not vast cloud of light, a burst of light that we saw in our telescopes. But it also sent out a thin rain of particles. Okay, this shower of purple streaks that you see here are subatomic particles called neutrinos. Now the supernova when it died, when that star died, it gave off 10 to the 57 neutrinos. Okay, so those of you who remember your math, that's a one followed by 57 zeros. It's a big number, okay? These neutrinos went every direction in the universe, just like the light from that supernova. And we saw the light from the supernova in our telescopes here on Earth. But when those neutrinos went through the Earth, 
30 trillion of them went through every man, woman, and child on Earth. And we didn't even know it. They're very hard to detect. Okay? But astronomers had been anticipating an event like this for a long time. And we had built a special observatory, which you see surrounding you right now. This is an image of the Kamiokanda Observatory in Japan. It's a gigantic vessel of super pure water that's deep underground. And the walls of the vessel are lined, each one of these little bubbles, with very sensitive cameras. And when all of those neutrinos came streaming through the Earth, some of them interacted with the water in the vast number of water in this chamber here in this neutrino observatory and created little bits of light that you could pick up with these little cameras. So 30 trillion neutrinos went through every one of us here and astronomers in all the neutrino detectors in the world detected 25 neutrinos from that supernova. And it was enough to convince them that they had detected the supernova with neutrinos. It was the first time in history that we had ever detected a phenomena from out there in the cosmos with both light with our telescopes and with some other detection technique, in this case, neutrinos. This is the birth of what we call multi-messenger astronomy. This is multi-messenger astronomy with subatomic particles and light. And 30 years ago, this was the bleeding edge frontier of what modern astronomy was like. This is what astronomy was like when I started in this game. Okay? So, let's fast forward to today. It's 2018, and the way you get better at astronomy is you build bigger and better instruments. So my life in the backyard has improved. I've built bigger telescopes than the one that I had when I started college. Uh, I have two of them. Uh, there's one that I can move easy and one that I can't, okay? But you build bigger telescopes because you want to see farther into the universe. Bigger telescopes let you see fainter things. Okay? And so the astronomers, the professional astronomers, the backyard astronomers have figured this out. The professional astronomers have figured this out. And today, the preeminent telescope in the world is, in fact, not on Earth. It's above the Earth. It's the Hubble Space Telescope. And we are rapidly approaching its 30th year of operation. It is arguably the most successful scientific instrument in history. It has seen farther and seen more than any telescope ever built by humans. It has something like 10 to 15,000 scientific papers written about all the observations of all the things that they've seen in the universe. Some of you may know there was a little bit of difficulty in the last month or so where we were having uh, equipment failures and it's difficult to point, but uh, we've overcome those and it's still operational. But we are approaching the end of Hubble's life and very soon it will no longer be with us and we'll talk about that a little more. Now, when we launch these machines, when we build any telescope, we have things that we are going to do with them. We have things we want them to observe. We have uh, programs we want them to carry out. They certainly discover new and exciting things that we never expected. But with Hubble, there was something in particular we wanted it to do. We wanted it to take a picture that no other telescope could take because of its vantage point and its ability to look at the cosmos from far above the Earth's atmosphere. And so in the constellation of Eridanus, we found a point in the sky where there wasn't really much of anything there. And over the course of a decade, we asked Hubble to look at that same point in the sky over and over and over and over again until it had stared at that one spot in the sky for a grand total of 23 days. So if you stare at a point in the sky for 23 days where you think there's nothing and you stack all the pictures together, you get one of the most startling and revelatory images ever taken by human beings. This is called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. And in a place in the sky where we thought there was nothing, you see a whole bunch of something. Every fleck of light, every smudge that you see there is another galaxy. There are some 5,000 galaxies 
In that picture, which covers a region in the sky about the size of the head of a needle if you held it out at arm's length. And so you imagine if you could cover the whole sky with pictures like this, there are going to be some 500 billion galaxies throughout the entire cosmos. This is the scale that the universe exists in. And we didn't have any idea that this was true until we could take a picture like this with Hubble. Now, you and I live in the future. So pictures don't just have to be two-dimensional pictures, right? We know the distances to every one of those galaxies. And through the magic of being able to do visualization and project it for you here on the dome, we can take a journey that flies us through the Hubble Deep Field image from here in our home Milky Way galaxy all the way towards the most distant galaxy that we can see in that image, which is very close to the edge of the visible universe. Right now, you and I are traveling at enormous speeds through the Hubble Deep Field. And the first thing you notice is that mostly what we encounter is absolutely nothing. The universe is enormously vast, but it's mostly filled with nothing. And every now and then, some bursting group of galaxies will go shooting by us. And this is one of the interesting things that we've learned about the structure of the universe, is that galaxies very seldom live alone. They grow together in clusters, and when you look at their distribution here in an image like this Hubble Deep Field and you fly through it, you find that they are gathered together in the same places in space. They don't always look that dissimilar to our own galaxy. As you watch the galaxy stream by you, you will see now and then there's one that looks kind of like footballs. You'll see some that look kind of like spirals. But they look more or less like galaxies. But astronomy is a time machine. As we go farther back into the Hubble Deep Field, we are looking farther back in time. And so each of these most distant galaxies that we look at is a galaxy from earlier in its life. And so we can piece together the story of galaxies by looking at how galaxies looked long ago in these faraway pictures that we're taking. If you were to leap all the way to the end of the Hubble Deep Field and look at the most distant galaxies that we can see, these galaxies formed about 450 million years after the Big Bang. And they do not look like galaxies that we see today. They're small. They're blobby, they're kind of red. These are the baby galaxies. This is what galaxies look like when they first form. And so one of the things that we're very interested in as professional astronomers is, OK, what's the deal with how galaxies are born? Okay, And together with images like this and other data, we're slowly working out the story of how galaxies grow and live out their lives. OK? Now. Our friends who do neutrino astronomy, they have not been uh, you know, uh, idle either. They've been building new and bigger and better neutrino telescopes as well. Today, the preeminent neutrino telescope in the world is located in Antarctica at South Pole. What they've done is at South Pole Station, they've bored these very deep holes down into the ice, and they've lowered on cables into those holes cameras kind of like those ones that you saw on the walls of the Kami Okanda uh, experiment when we looked at the Neutrino Observatory earlier. And in those holes, they uh, lower them down into the ice about a kilometer, and the water freezes around them. And down into, it's going to come up here, I think, OK? Down into the ice, what you see is this vast array of cameras that is completely surrounding you, OK? Now, on each one of these strings, we are doing the exact same thing we were doing in our neutrino detector before. We're watching, not for the neutrinos themselves, but for the effects of the neutrinos on the stuff around them. When neutrinos travel through the Antarctic ice, every now and then, they generate a little bit of light. And then that light is picked up by all of our cameras here. And so what you'll see here, going across the front from left to right, is a neutrino event that we saw last year. This is the most energetic neutrino event ever detected by one of our neutrino detectors on Earth. And what I want you to notice is if you look at that data, you'll notice it has a definite shape. And you notice it had a definite 
trajectory that it traveled. It traveled from left to right. That shape, that long elongated line that that neutrino follows, allows us to take the direction the neutrino traveled through Ice Cube and point back on the sky so that we can try and figure out where the neutrino came from. So our colleagues in Ice Cube point it back on the sky. We get all of our giant telescopes that we've been building, and we go look and we see what is it out there that we can see. And what we see is that the neutrino points back to a very special kind of galaxy called an AGN, an active galactic nuclei. What these galaxies are is galaxies that have deep down in their core a supermassive black hole, a black hole that is millions or billions of times the mass of our sun. It has swirling around it a maelstrom of gas and dust that is slowly falling in towards the black hole. As it gets closer and closer to the black hole, it begins to move very fast, it gets very hot, it emits a lot of light. Some of that gas and dust and material falls onto the black hole, but some of it's spinning so fast, it can't actually reach the black hole. Kind of like you trying to crawl to the center of a fast spinning merry-go-round, okay? And when that happens, it gets squirted out along the spinning direction of the black hole, and it creates this jet that you see arcing over our head. And what we found out about this galaxy that this neutrino came from is that from our vantage point here on Earth, we're actually looking directly down that jet. So this is a special kind of AGN that we call a blazar. And what we're doing is we're looking straight down that jet where all of those really super energetic particles are being squirted out straight at us at Earth, and it's kind of like a mini particle accelerator. All of those particles are interacting and colliding with each other and doing all those things that happen in particle accelerators. And somewhere at some time in this jet, all of the material collided together and generated that neutrino that then shot across the universe until we detected it here on Earth. This, once again, is that multi-messenger astronomy that I told you about. But what's different about this is this is the first time that our colleagues who do neutrino astronomy have led the discovery. They said, look, we saw this thing in our telescope. Go point your other telescopes and tell us what you see. Okay? So rather than the, the other direction, the supernova triggered it before, this time the neutrino triggered the surge for this blazar that we saw. So you can imagine this stirs up intense interest because black holes are way cool. But there are other black holes that are closer to Earth that we're also interested in. So if you go home to our own Milky Way galaxy, we have been studying a black hole close to home. And the way we've been doing that is we have built an enormous telescope. Today, the largest telescope in the world are the twin 10-meter Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the two domes that you see here on the left side of the dome. Uh, there are many telescopes on the summit at Mauna Kea. This is the Subaru telescope over here on the left. But the largest telescopes are these 10-meter telescopes uh, in uh, Hawaii. Now, when you make a telescope really big, you can see things that are really difficult to see in any other way. And so if you use the Keck telescope, which we've been doing for the last 25 years or so, and you stare down at the center of the Milky Way, what you can see is individual stars deep down in the core of our own galaxy, down near the center. And we've been watching them for 25 years, and we've discovered there's an entire cluster, an entire family of them living down at the center of the Milky Way. And so what you see surrounding you is this cluster of stars, the so-called S cluster. And what you see behind every one of these stars is an orbit. And this represents the power of our technology now. We can see these stars accurately enough, and we've watched them long enough, that we can actually see them moving on orbits, the way you and I can watch the moon or the planets move on orbits around the sun. except we're watching the stars orbit something at the center of the Milky Way. Now, if you look right there at the center where you see all the star orbits uh, collecting, you don't see that we've plotted anything. And that's because in our telescopes, we don't see anything there. But if you look back in your dim memories to the time you took a physics class from someone like me, 
you may remember that we told you if I can measure an orbit, these blue orbits that you and I see on the dome here, that I can use the shape and size and time of that orbit to tell you how much gravity is required to make that orbit the shape that it is. And what we find is down there at the center, where there's nothing plotted, there has to be something that has the gravitational equivalent of four million times the mass of our own sun. That is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way and is the closest massive black hole to us. We call it Sagittarius A star. Now, one of these stars we've been watching very intensely for the last couple of years. You see it highlighted there. That's called SO2. And just last year, we saw it make its closest pass by the black hole. And if you watch that orbit, you'll see it's going one direction. And very quickly, over the course of just a couple of months, it completely changes the direction it travels on the sky. And how that happens depends very intensely on the exact nature of the black hole. Okay? And so this allows us, for the first time, to test our astrophysical predictions about what is that black hole like? What's its mass? How is it spinning? How is its gravitational field shaped? How is it distorting the universe around it? And we can compare it to the predictions made by general relativity, which is Einstein's description of gravity. And so this has shown us, for the most accurate measurement we've ever made in history, that indeed this black hole is exactly the black hole, the kind of black hole predicted by general relativity. Okay, so this has been a very important and exciting moment for us because it confirms something that we've been thinking about now for the last hundred years. Now, gravity plays a central role in all of these stories. Um, it is the governing force that drives everything in the universe. But Einstein, when he first wrote down general relativity, he made another prediction about how we could use gravity in astronomy. He predicted that there was a way to study the universe not with light and not with particles, but with gravity itself. That gravity and changes in gravity could move from one place in the cosmos to another. And that if you could somehow detect that, you could tell something about the things making the gravity. So what you see here in the front of the dome is a ring of test particles, test masses. And what we're doing is we're imagining what would happen if you had a set of little masses and you allowed some of this moving gravity in the universe to pass by them. Gravity affects all massive things, so the way to look for gravity is to watch what it does to massive things. This propagating distortion in gravity is what we call a gravitational wave. It is a puckering, a warping, a stretching of the fabric of the universe. And what it does is it takes any given mass and it pushes it around. So that if you look at a collection of masses, it looks like sometimes the masses are being pushed together and sometimes the masses are being pulled apart. And so if I had a ring of them, a gravitational telescope, if you will, then I could watch them distort back and forth whenever one of these gravitational waves pass through them. Now, gravitational waves aren't just located in one place in space, they propagate through the universe. And if there's a source of gravitational waves right behind that ring, it passes through the ring, but then it keeps on going. And so what you see right now is you imagine you and I could fill the whole universe with a vast array of these little particles. You would see that gravitational wave passing by us. And the particles near us would stretch outward and inward, and the particles in front of us would stretch outward and inward, and the particles behind us would stretch outward and inward, and the whole gravitational wave would pass us by in this undulating warpage of space and time as the gravitational wave propagates through the universe. Okay? So th this was a stunningly cool idea. Einstein's like, wow! Okay? It took 50 years for physicists to decide, yeah, okay, maybe Einstein's right. Okay? And once we decided he was right, it took us another 50 years to build a telescope that could detect this. And as it turns out, you and I live in the future, and we've done that. The first telescope built capable of detecting these gravitational waves, the first gravitational observatory, is called LIGO. 
This is the LIGO Livingston Observatory. There are two sites that make up the single LIGO uh, instrument. The other one is in Hanford, Washington, very near where I grew up. There are a couple of others around the world. Our European partners have one outside Pisa called Virgo that works with us as well. What LIGO is, is it's a gigantic L shape that you see right there in the center of the image, okay? And it has a corner station, that's the red square. And then the arms stretch out in two directions from that red square, in four kilometers, in two different directions. And what we do is we hang little masses in the corner of the station and out at the ends of the station. And we monitor how far it is from one mass to the other with a laser. So if a gravitational wave passes through LIGO, then those masses at the ends of the arms undulate back and forth just like that ring of test masses that we were just talking about. And so when we're monitoring the mirrors in LIGO, we can see them get closer together and farther apart and closer together and farther apart just like our ring of test particles was doing when we thought about this at the start. Okay? Now, this has been a grand endeavor. It has taken decades and thousands of people to construct and build. And in 2015, we successfully detected gravitational waves for the first time. We have made many such detections since then. Most of them have been black holes colliding with other black holes. But I want to tell you tonight about one of the most exciting discoveries that we made in the summer of 2017. On August 17th, 2017, we made a detection with LIGO of a binary neutron star. So what are neutron stars? Neutron stars are two skeletons of dead stars. They're created in those supernova explosions that you and I talked about at the beginning. When the star explodes, it destroys the star, but it leaves behind a very tiny skeleton. It's about one and a half times the mass of the sun, but only about the size of a small city. Now, most stars in the universe are born and live their lives out with other stars. And so when they die, very often the skeletons live together in a binary, like you see here with these two neutron stars. Now, at the time LIGO first detected the gravitational waves from them, and you see the gravitational waves being shed in this visualization here, they were about 400 kilometers apart. And over the course of about 100 seconds, the gravitational waves were carrying energy away from the neutron stars. That causes the orbit to shrink and get smaller. As the orbit shrinks and gets smaller, the gravitational waves get stronger, and the stars start moving around each other faster and faster and faster. And there comes a point where they get so close together that they collide. And when that happens, it launches a gamma ray burst, which you saw shooting over your head there. And the stars explode and expand outward in a cloud of the shattered remains of what used to be the neutron stars that we call a kilonova. Now, the kilonova is the expanding super dense matter that used to be uh, part of the neutron stars. It is very hot, so it begins to cool, which generates light that we can see with our telescopes. And all of this material begins to recombine into super heavy atoms, stuff on the periodic table that you learned about in chemistry. And so the things that we only talk about are the things that we all find interesting, like gold and platinum, right? So these heavy elements are the stuff that are made in these kilonova explosions. And it is a resolution to a great mystery for us to discover and be able to watch that formation process in this event. The other thing that was important was that gamma ray burst that you saw at the beginning, which is we didn't know where those came from until we detected this event uh, in August of 2017. So we know now that these gamma ray bursts came from the merger of neutron stars. Now the problem with this story that I told you, it's not a problem, the difficulty with this story that I just told you is that I've just shown you a visualization of what happened. What you saw on the dome is not something any of us could ever see. You can't see this in a telescope. And in fact, gravitational wave data itself is not conducive to being shown as pictures like the Hubble makes or like the Keck telescope makes. 
the data itself is not like any data that your body is designed to sense. And so we struggle with how do we make it experiential for you so that you can understand the astrophysical data that's contained in it. Well, as it turns out, you can take the data and just push it out through the headphone jack on your phone, and it will turn the data into sound. And so what you hear right now is the sonification, the representation of the gravitational wave data as sound. So what you hear as the stars are beginning their spiral together is the sound is very low pitched. Okay, that's associated with how fast they're spinning around one another. But as they get closer and closer together, they start going faster and faster and faster. And so the pitch of that sound goes up. It gets higher. And as it spirals together, it gets higher and higher pitched, but they get louder because the gravitational waves are getting stronger. And it goes and it goes until the moment they merge. And that moment that they merge, which we call the chirp, is the end of the gravitational wave data. The data was over the moment those two neutron stars collided, and now we're spending all our time watching the fading kilonova explosion with traditional telescopes. So this is the modern multi-messenger story once again. In this case, the discovery was led by our gravitational wave scientists. We made this discovery early in the morning here in the Western Hemisphere. And over the course of the day, we figured out where on the sky that we thought the neutron star came from using data from LIGO and data from our partners at Virgo. And then we fed that information to our colleagues with telescopes. And they were able to point their telescopes and see the supernova. This today is the frontier of astronomy. And those of us who practice this today, this is what we're living through. The dramatic change of the way we see and understand the cosmos using tools that we never thought were possible when I started in this game 30 years ago. Okay? So let's make the leap ahead 30 more years. 2048. When I come back in 2048, I don't have any idea how big a telescope I'll be able to show you that I have in my backyard. Okay? If I have a lot of spousal approval units, it'll be huge. Okay? <laughs> However, professional astronomers, they know what their telescopes are going to look like. So what you see here is the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. It is the planned successor to Hubble. It's been built. It is currently undergoing tests, and it should launch within the next couple of years. If JWST has a career as long and lustrous as Hubble's, then the numbers of discoveries that we can expect from JWST will be extraordinary. Okay? We definitely have things we plan to do with it. We definitely have science we want to do with it. But there are going to be things that we never imagined and things that we just don't have any idea what we're going to be taught by an instrument bigger than any telescope ever flown in space before. Okay? So this is in the next couple of years, and you will see it on the news when it launches. As you heard in the introduction, I am part of the team looking ahead to the future of gravitational wave astronomy. And so we are planning on building a gravitational wave detector in space called LISA the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. It's much like LIGO in that we have three masses, three mirrors that we're going to be monitoring. Uh, I have a mock-up of this with me, so afterwards, if you want to chat with me, I'll show you the, uh, the uh, mirror that we use on LISA. But the mirrors are housed inside three spacecraft. And those three spacecraft are separated in space by two and a half million kilometers. So it's about a million times larger than LIGO. It's so big, it's about eight times the Earth-Moon separation, that it orbits the sun following along behind the Earth, as you see it doing here on the dome. Okay, that little red triangle there is LISA. So the question is, OK, why should you make a gravitational observatory that's a million times larger than LIGO? 
Well, those neutron stars that you and I saw, those neutron stars go around each other about 100 to 1,000 times every second. They're in very tiny, very tight orbits. The things that LISA will detect go around each other about once every 100 seconds or once every 1,000 seconds. So much wider, much slower orbits. And as it turns out, there are lots of things in the universe that are in slow orbits like that. In particular, if you look at our own Milky Way galaxy, okay, there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way, and the Milky Way has been around for 10 billion years, and stars, like people, they're born, they live, and they die. And so the Milky Way is actually populated by about 10 million dead stars called white dwarfs that are orbiting other dead white dwarfs. White dwarfs are also dead skeletons of stars. They're the sorts of things that stars make when they can't undergo a supernova explosion. If a star is not big enough, when it dies, it kind of swells up and then it shrinks down and it becomes something about the mass of the sun but only about the size of the Earth, a dying, faint ember of what it used to be. And since most stars live with other stars, then the skeletons of these white dwarfs are in binaries throughout the Milky Way. What you're seeing here is a visualization of that stellar graveyard, of the stellar graveyard of the Milky Way that was created by my student, my former student, Katie Brevik, now Dr. Katie Brevik, okay? We simulate on a computer the entire life history of the Milky Way and ask, what does the stellar graveyard look like? Where are the white dwarfs? Where did they come from? And what do they tell us about the life and history of stars in our own Milky Way galaxy? What you see here in this uh, visualization are the 10,000 brightest ones that LISA will detect. So LISA, the moment we fly it, we will begin to map out the stellar graveyard of the Milky Way. Now you might ask yourself, oh my gosh, there's 10 million of these and you're looking at 10,000 of them in the Milky Way. How are you ever going to be able to tell them apart? Okay, we can use that sonification again to show you that. If you imagine this white dwarf that's right here near the front, if we listen to its signal as Lisa orbits around the sun, You'll hear that signal pitch go up and down, warbling up and warbling down. Okay? Now, some of you, remembering your physics class again, may remember that that's called the Doppler effect. When Lisa is moving towards the white dwarf, it drives the pitch up, and when it's moving away from the white dwarf, it drives the pitch down. And where the white dwarf is on the sky changes that warbling. So if we look at this white dwarf above our head, you'll hear that its signal sounds a little different because it's in a different place and Lisa is moving with respect to it in a different way. So if I play them both together, if you listen, you can pick them out one from the other. They're both there. It's not unlike when we were all in here laughing it up, telling jokes before the talk. You were talking to the person sitting next to you, and you could hear them just fine. And you were ignoring everyone else around you. But if you perk up your ears, you can hear the conversation behind you, and the conversation in front of you, and the conversation to your left. This is the same game that we're going to play with Lisa. Now, the Milky Way galaxy are not the only things making gravitational waves that Lisa can see out there. Remember, black holes are cool? Well. At the center of every big galaxy like the Milky Way, there is a big black hole. And over the course of cosmic history, galaxies sometimes find each other. They sometimes collide and create new galaxies that are the colossal merger of the two galaxies that were uh, in the collision. And if they have big black holes, those big black holes sink down to the center, and they find each other, and they merge, and they create gravitational waves. What you see around you is a simulation from my graduate student, Michael Katz, which was extracted from a cosmological simulation of 
galaxies across cosmic time called the Lustrous. And what Michael did is, is he went into that simulation and he looked at every galaxy that collided and he pulled out the black holes and he asked the question, would Lisa be able to see this in gravitational waves or not? And if it was, he plotted it in this map. And what you see is that all the black holes that emit gravitational waves that are plausibly detectable by Lisa, they map out that cosmic structure that you and I were talking about when we first flew into the Hubble Deep Field. You see the locations of all the black hole mergers on the sky map out the locations of all the galaxies where they're living together, orbiting each other, finding each other, colliding, and living out their lives. Now, this is all behind the Milky Way. So we're back home in the Milky Way. You can see all of the white dwarf binaries there that Lisa's going to see. You can see the Lisa orbit there coming in behind us. And behind it, you can see all of those black holes. And just like with the white dwarfs, that's all going to be going on at the same time. Every moment that Lisa's on, we're going to be sensing gravitational waves from the universe. It's not going to be like LIGO, where we get an event, and then we wait a little while, and we get another event. It's all going on at the same time. And if I sonify it, this is what it sounds like. This is all the white dwarfs going off at once. And if you listen, you'll hear a big black hole merging, chirping. And then it keeps going. Okay? It's hard to hear here, but there's all kinds of things going on. This is white dwarfs. This is stars falling into black holes. It's supermassive black holes merging. And it's all going to be happening at the same time. And so this is what our job as gravitational wave astronomers is. We've spent 400 years learning how to take pictures that we take with telescopes and interpret what they mean about the universe. And today, the frontiers of astronomy are taking data like the data you're listening to now and trying to figure out how do we take that and turn it into stories about where the universe came from and what its history was. But this isn't the only thing that's going on, right? At the same time Lisa's going to be doing this, our neutrino astronomers are going to be looking at the sky in ever more powerful ways. And all of these flashing dots are the sources of individual neutrinos that we can expect on the sky at the same time. And behind it all, you see what you and I are used to seeing from our own backyards. The visible light from the Milky Way, and all the distant stars and all the distant galaxies in the universe that we can see with ordinary telescopes. This is what the future of astronomy is going to be like. No longer just looking with an instrument that mimics what our bodies already can do. In just the course of my and your lifetime, we have developed the capability to observe the universe, not just with light, but with particles and with gravity and to merge the, all of that information together to make one synthesized, coherent story about the nature of the cosmos around us. Okay? So that's all I'm going to tell you today. I'll say thanks so much for your attention, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> I'm Andrew Johnson. I'm the Vice President for Astronomy and Collections here at the, at the at Planetarium. We've just gone on an amazing journey with, with some of the visuals that you've seen that were produced right here by our team uh, here at the Adler. But the journey is not over. We have time for uh, some questions. So if you're listening in to, uh, from one of our remote venues, please do submit those questions right now. Uh, I actually do have a list of the venues right here, so I'd, we'd like to say hello to some of our friends out there. Uh, first of all, at the Macmillan Space Center in Vancouver, Canada, hello. The Peoria Riverfront Museum in Peoria, the Museum of Discovery, Fort Collins. The Allworth Planetarium, the University of Minnesota. The uh, Minnesota State University, we've got Minnesota covered pretty well tonight. <laughs> so. And also Mayo High School in Rochester, Minnesota, just when you thought the Minnesotans were done. Um, and University of Alaska uh, in Anchorage. Uh, then we also have uh, several groups actually listening in uh, from the, with using VR headsets at Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago. Yay. 
Uh, Henry Riddle Aeronautical uh, University in Arizona, hello. Uh, also uh, listening in and, and watching in uh, from Pittsburgh, Looking for Group, which is a gaming center. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, the Beloit Regional Hospice in Beloit, Wisconsin. Uh, the Settlemeyer Planetarium in Rock Hill, South Carolina. The Fernbank Science Center in Atlanta. The Lower East Side Girls Club in New York. Hello out there. Uh, Planetarium Wien in Vienna. Guten Abend. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Imiloa Astronomy Center. So hello to our friends in Hilo, Hawaii. Really glad you could join us all. So uh, before we start to taking some, some questions, I just want to point out two things that you can see on the dome right now. First of all, we have a survey that you can fill out, which is on that side right there, on my right, your left. So go to that link right there you see on the, on the dome. Uh, and actually tell us uh, what you thought about tonight so that we can help make these programs ever more awesome. Uh, also, in the center of the dome, you can actually see uh, a link that you can also check out. Here at the Adler Planetarium, we're really proud to help uh, bring the world uh, the Zooniverse platform, which, which is the world's leading platform for citizen science, where you can actually take part in real science projects and actually help astronomers and scientists of all kinds of uh, different kinds of scientists actually understand nature. And one of the projects we should call out there is Gravity Spy, where you can actually log in and help to uh, interpret all of those chirps and tweets and things <laughs> like that in the data that Shane was sharing so that the scientists can actually better understand what's going on out there with gravitational waves. Yeah. So with that, we're actually going to start taking some questions. We're going to start by taking a question here in Chicago. If you do have a question, please put your hand up and wait for me to come to you with the microphone so that everybody can hear us. I got a question up front here. Please go ahead. I'm very interested in the Webb telescope. How big will it be? Where will it be? And how will they get it up there? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the James Webb, spell is, uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope is much larger than Hubble. Hubble's two-ish meters across and Webb is about three times that size. You'll notice in the picture that the mirror was hexagonal segments. So it's so big, it can't be launched as a, as a single mirror. So the whole telescope's going to be folded up. It'll be put on a very big rocket. And when it gets into space, it's going to have to unfold origami style. So this is one of the big challenges. And it's one of the things that freaks people like me and you out, if you ever watch the movie of it. But our engineers who do this, they're like, oh, yeah, no problem. We can do that. We can, we can sky crane landers on the Mars. We can origami unfold telescopes in space. No problem, right? Um, it's actually going to be in space. And one of the things you may remember about Hubble is that it was in Earth orbit. So the shuttle could go to Hubble and service it many times over the course of its career. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be farther out. So it will actually be far enough away that we cannot service it. And so this will ultimately be one of the things that limits its, its lifetime. Okay. Now, some of you may have heard that we had some difficulties with the telescope. Uh, you know, um, we test everything to the max when we did. So about a year ago, they had put it on a shake test. And when they shook it really hard, some of the rivets fell off. Okay, so right now, the reason it's not up right now while you and I are talking is they're replacing all the rivets. They're going to shake it again, and then it'll launch in about two years. Okay? We have a question at one of our remote venues. We've got quite a few. Uh, we'll start off with a uh, question from Mayo High School in Rochester, Minnesota. They're wondering, with all these new types of technologies coming online, new, more advanced telescopes, will we ever be able to see into a black hole? Yeah, so by definition, black holes are objects whose gravity is so strong, nothing can escape. And that's because to escape the black hole, you would have to travel faster than the speed of light. And the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit in the universe. Now, the interesting uh, question is always what is inside the black hole. But nothing can get out of the black hole because you can't go fast enough. But there are interesting aspects of general relativity which say that the insides of some black holes may indeed be tunnels, what we call wormholes. And things that fall into a black hole, if they go through one of these tunnels, they come out on the far side of the tunnel, which is called a white hole. Okay? Now, as astronomers, we don't know if white holes exist or not, but we can definitely look for them. And so if we were ever to detect a white hole and be able to tell that it was a white hole, it would tell us something very deep and interesting about the inside of a black hole. Now, what I can say is as an astronomer, we've never seen anything that we think is a white hole, but that doesn't mean we don't 
spend time looking for them or paying attention to see if something interesting and weird shows up. So, cool. We'll follow that up with a question from Vancouver. Uh, they said hi back, by the way, uh, Andrew. <laughs> uh, uh, hello. <laughs> Uh, they were wondering, uh, kind of a two-part question. Uh, one, do gravitational waves travel at the speed of light? Mm -hmm. And two, how do these gravitational wave discoveries affect and impact us here on the Earth? So one of the predictions of Einstein's uh, uh, original description of gravitational waves is that they do indeed travel at the speed of light. Uh, the binary neutron star detection that I told you about, where we were able to detect that gamma ray burst and the gravitational waves, we were able to test that idea to very extreme precision. Uh, and indeed, they seem to travel at the speed of light. Uh, one of the things in my PhD thesis is you can use these white dwarf binaries because you can see them in telescopes at the same time you can see them with LISA all the time, every night. In fact, many of these white dwarf binaries you can see with a telescope in your backyard. And so if you monitor the light from one of these white dwarfs at the same time you're monitoring it from LISA, you can also test that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Okay? Um, the question of what is this good for on Earth is one that we get a lot, particularly in this kind of frontier science. And the answer I think that's best for that is that Every kind of modern discovery that you hear about, whether it's a discovery like you and I are talking about in astronomy, or whether it's a discovery like the Higgs boson, all of those things are discoveries from the very edge of everything that we understand. We barely understand enough to be able to tell you what we just discovered, which means we don't even remotely have the kind of understanding needed to turn it into something useful to help your golf game or help you in the kitchen. Okay, Those kinds of applications, the engineering of knowledge into things that are useful for human life, is for the future. Okay, But that doesn't mean our lives aren't being impacted by what's going on right now. People will often grouse at you that we've spent $400 million to build LIGO, or we spent a billion dollars to build the Hubble Space Telescope and launch it. But we didn't strap a billion dollars onto a rocket and shoot it into space. We spent a billion dollars getting computer scientists to develop programs capable of producing the images. And we use those programs today for medical imaging. We spent a billion dollars paying someone to s weld the titanium for the rocket. And they used that money to pay to send their kids to college. The money we spend on these endeavors isn't spent on the thing itself. The knowledge is the product of that, but the money gets spent on people like me and you. And ultimately, that's the true impact of what this is. We get the knowledge, and we get all the benefit that it leads to our society. That's wonderful. I'll uh, we'll take one more remote question uh, for now from Fort Collins. Uh, on the, the line of detecting and identifying things, any thoughts on how we can detect dark matter or dark energy? <laughs> OK, so this is the gazillion dollar question. What is dark matter and what is dark energy? We have known about dark matter since 1933. Okay, And today, what do we know about dark matter? Dark matter is uh, gravitationally attractive. It makes galaxies spin faster than they should. And that's pretty much everything we know about dark matter. Okay, So the thing about dark matter is how we detect it depends on what it is. And so our colleagues who do things like these neutrino experiments, they are building uber-sensitive experiments, not dissimilar to the neutrino ones, uh, that if dark matters are particle-like in nature, they in principle should be able to detect the dark matter. Of course, we don't know what it is. We're just guessing. Okay? And I would say we've been doing this a while, and we're starting to get worried that maybe we're not right. Similarly, if dark matter is something big and massive, it should generate gravitational waves. And so there is always the possibility that LIGO or LISA will detect gravitational waves from something. And we're like, what is that? Does it look like a black hole? Does it look like a neutron star? No, maybe not. Maybe that's the dark matter. I will say that the gravitational wave detection of LIGO by the first black holes that we saw has re-stimulated the interest of astrophysical theorists, people like me, to start thinking again about whether or not dark matter could be black holes in the universe. And there are some interesting ideas out there, and future gravitational wave data may shed some light on that. So we don't know, but we're working on it. 
Okay. M maybe we'll take a question here in Chicago, maybe on this side of the room, since I'm standing over here. If you have a question, put up your here hand up. Front, Andrew. Oh, yes, here I come. Thank you. Um, can neutrinos pass through absolutely anything, or is there something that they can't pass through? Yeah, so that's a great question. So neutrinos are extremely weakly interacting with all forms of matter. They absolutely just don't see matter there very often at all. But they do interact with matter sometimes. Okay, And the way we actually discovered neutrinos is through the interactions that they have with another kind of particle called a neutron. Okay, so neutrons will sometimes decay into what's called a proton and an electron, and sometimes protons and electrons can combine to form a neutron. And when we were studying that interaction in the 1930s, we were noticing that there was missing energy in those interactions. And so um, uh, I think it was Wolfgang Pauli uh, posited that there must be some particle that we have never imagined or seen before because they're so difficult to interact with. And we went searching for it, and ultimately we did discover the neutrinos. So they do interact with matter, but just not very often. So if I throw a billion of them at you, most of them are going to go right through you, but there's maybe a one in a billion chance that one of them will interact with one of your atoms. Okay? Okay. All right, another question now. I you see and specifically so how does the LIGO gravitational wave detector work? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So... Remember I told you there are mirrors hanging at the ends of the arms and at the corner. Okay, And so what we do is we shine a laser from the corner out to the mirror at the end of the arm and from the corner out to the mirror at the end of the other arm. And what we do is we time how long it takes that laser to make the trip. So if a gravitational wave comes by, what it does is it stretches one of those arms. It pushes the mirrors farther apart. So the laser light that's going down that arm takes longer to get to the mirror and come back again. It gets home late. Okay? And at the same time down the other arm, the arm's getting shorter, so the laser light goes back and it hits the mirror early, so it gets home early. And so what I'm doing is I'm constantly comparing one arm to the other. And so one arm gets short and one arm gets long, so the laser light gets back early and late, and then when they switch, this one gets back early and late. And it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's what we're looking for. You all see this? It's called the gravitational wave dance. You look cool doing it at parties. OK. Does that help? OK. All right, we got a couple of questions from the remote venues. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions, actually. Um, kay. Folks at University of Alaska Anchorage are wondering when Lisa will launch. And then uh, Sabrina, who's a YouTube viewer, is wondering how long the mission will last and how long it'll be able to communicate back with Earth. Okay, so right now, uh, the schedule will, t if you look at the schedule, it's supposed to launch in the early 2030s. Um, we are right now ahead of schedule, and so if you talk to us scientists, not the people who are writing the checks, we would like it to launch a little bit earlier than that. So I would say sometime at the end of the next decade, you will start hearing a lot more about when our launch date actually is. Um, once it's launched, it will follow along behind the Earth, and it will be stable for at least 10 years. So the mission will last uh, as long as the constellation remains in that triangular shape, and it will last as long as our lasers continue to operate. Um, the lasers run continuously all the time, and um, as sure many of you know, if you like leave all your light bulbs at home on continuously all the time, eventually they burn out, and lasers are the same way. So the lasers ultimately will, will be our lifetime limit for LISA. But 10 years is about what we're, we're hoping and expecting. Okay. And continuing with the subject of LISA, uh, the folks in Fargo-Moorhead were wondering, if LISA is casting such a wide net for gravitational waves, how can you separate out all those hundreds and thousands of signals from one another? Right. So, so this, is, this is the great difficulty. It's the computational physics problem that we have to face up to. Um, but it is possible to do, and, and we do it all the time already. So you do it all the time already. Let's go back to that example we were talking about when we were all in here talking before the start. Right? So we call this the lunchroom or the cocktail party problem. When you're hanging out in a party and everyone's talking, you can't hear 
everything that's going on. All the conversations are mixed together. That's called confusion. And we definitely have that in Lisa. I told you there were 10 million white dwarf binaries. We are not going to be able to separate out every one of the 10 million white dwarf binaries. They're confused, just like all the conversations at the party. But what you can hear are the loud things and the things that are really close to you. Okay, And so when we were listening to the sonification, right, you heard the loud black hole chirp in the background. That's just super loud compared to everything else that was going on. That's the really loud person across the party who you can hear no matter where you're standing. Okay, And then the things that are close, the closest white dwarfs and the loudest white dwarfs are the ones that we'll hear in the galaxy. So this is definitely something we worry about. It's something that we can't completely solve. But it's something that is already being worked on in many different uh, technology applications. In particular, cell phone technology does this. right? If you want to think about what this problem is like, imagine your colleague who works for AT&T and how they have to separate the three million texts that are sent at every high school every day. Right? That's our problem. Right? OK. Do we have another remote question? Uh, sure. We'll uh, switch gears a little bit, uh, friends down the road in Peoria. Uh, they wanted to know if there is any way to predict when the star Betelgeuse will go supernova. <laughs> so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Betelgeuse is a star in Orion. It is currently in its red giant phase. It's a very giant, very old star. And this is the last stage that stars go through before they ultimately decide to collapse and supernova. And so... Um, I think, as with all things in astronomy, astronomers will tell you it could be imminent, but imminent in the cosmic sense, right? Which is not next Thursday, but sometime soon, maybe not in our it, lifetime. It could be next Thursday. It could be next Thursday, and we would love it to be next Thursday, but I would really rather it wait until after LIGO turns back on next year, okay? So we can get the gravitational waves from it. Um, the problem is, is that we know stars go supernova. But we've never seen one in the Milky Way. We've never been able to study one up close. And so all our ideas about how stars explode and what goes on are informed by looking at supernovas that are so far away, we can't see all the nitty gritty details. We're guessing about exactly what goes on in a star's life leading up to the supernova and during the supernova. And then we try and simulate it on a computer to help us understand what might happen to a star like Betelgeuse. And the simple fact of the matter is we, we don't know enough to do it accurately yet. Okay? So it would be awesome if it would do it in my, in my career. Okay. <laughs> do we have a question here at the other, maybe on this side, on the right we have, side? Yeah, we have one up here or over there. We, we okay. do? We, there's one, been one waiting right here. So okay, there two. we go. Yeah, I'll, sorry. I'll get you. <laughs> Where is it? Put your hand up, please. Right Who? This guy? Yeah. Right there? This guy, yeah. Oddly enough, every question I had had already been asked. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> about the um, dark matter. But I had a um, maybe a philosophical question about the, um, the age of the universe, the cosmos, in uh -huh. terms of the end of it being a barrier or being infinite. You can answer that question because yeah. it's always the question yeah. people ask. So this is actually a question we ask as astronomers, right? Which is, what is the ultimate fate of the universe, right? If we, if we look out into the universe, we can tell how long it's been expanding since what we call the Big Bang. Okay, so that's the 13.8 billion years. But the ultimate question of what is its future has a lot to do with what is the dark matter and what is the dark energy. And if you had asked me that question 20 years ago when I first started, I think astronomers would have told you the universe is going to expand forever and coast. Okay? And if you ask astronomers today, some of them will tell you that, and some of them will tell you, I don't know, because we don't know what the dark energy is. <laughs> right? What the dark energy is has tremendous impact on what the ultimate phase of the future of the universe might be. It may be expanding forever, like we always thought. It certainly looks like that's possible. But there are these weird ideas that maybe the universe might expand and some point collapse again. Maybe it's been doing that for infinite time before our universe, and that some universe before us went through a big crunch, and then went into a big bang and became our universe, and there's another big crunch in the future, right? Who knows? But it all depends on. What is all this stuff that we don't know what it is? Okay? So, 
So, and you're right, that's a deeply philosophical question, and we can write down everything we want about it, but we just, we don't have any information to really tell us what the answer is. So in 30 years, I'll bet you a Dr. Pepper, we're still having that argument. <laughs> All right, we got a question over here. Uh, so I had a question about uh, kind of quantum computing. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, I know that the like X-rays emitted near black holes, yeah. at least from what I've read recently, have properties that um, relate to quantum com computing and uh, how it might explain it. And I guess I just wanted to ask you what the relationship is and its significance. I think I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know what you've been reading. <laughs> okay, but let me tell you something, which is quantum mechanics, which is the study of the behavior of the very small, is a subject that surprisingly is intimately connected to astrophysics and cosmology. And that's because the physics of what happens on the very small intimately affects all of these things you and I have been talking about. What happens near black holes? What happens to matter when you collide it at enormously strong energies? What happened in the universe when it was very tiny and everything was packed closely together? And so there are all kinds of interesting connections between our colleagues who study quantum mechanics and quantum chromodynamics and quantum electrodynamics and the standard model of particle physics and the sorts of things that we think about in astronomy. And I can't tell you exactly what you've read about quantum computing because I haven't read it. Um, but uh, you know, if you want to point at an article sometime, we could certainly take a look at it and figure out what it says. But, but the two subjects are not completely divorced from each other, right? Which is counterintuitive, right? Quantum mechanics is about the very tiny, Cosmology is about the very large, but they're really connected in the very deep ways. So, okay. Do we have another question here at the Adler? Now I'm back on this side of the dome. Anybody? Yeah, here's one right here. So what is the chance, given the rate of technology affecting science, that by the time Lisa is ready to launch, it, you said it, 2030? 2030, yeah. That there'll be a whole new different dynamic about how science studies the universe. Yeah, that, that's very real. So, so th what w the LIGO story that I told you, the multi-messenger cooperation between telescopes and gravitational waves, that's completely brand new, right? Right now, we are just figuring out how to talk to each other so that we can go observe the same spot on the sky, right? We create all of our data in gravitational wave physics, so I work on LIGO as well, right? And then we hand it to our astronomer friends and they're like, what's this? And they're like, look, what we need to know is right ascension and declination and what time you saw this, right? And we're like, oh, okay. And so then we go back and we rewrite our computer goes and we produce a little bit of information to give them differently, right? We are just learning how to collaborate together, which of course is what science is all about. You can't do science on the scale that you and I are talking about without knowing how to talk to each other, right? And so in, th in 10 years, when Lisa flies, we hope we will have worked a lot of those kinks out, right? So multi-messenger astronomy, where you combine telescopes with gravitational wave detectors, we think a lot of the kinks will be worked out, okay? What we haven't worked out yet is how are we going to sift through all of the data that you and I have been talking about and decide what's important and what's not important? Okay, and that's, going, that's what I think is going to be the biggest challenge between now and then, is how do we take all of this data and all these things going on around us in the dome here and decide which is the important things that we need to communicate back and forth to each other so that we can get the maximum science out of the enormous investment that we've made in these great machines. That's going to be the real challenge. Sociology is always hard, right? But we, we figure it out, and we're going to have to figure that out before Lisa flies. But this problem, the big amount of data and what do we decide to talk about, that's going to be the real challenge. So we're, we're almost out of time, but maybe we have time for uh, another remote question. Sure. Uh, we can fit in a couple, I bet. Uh, I'm going to uh, combine questions from, uh, from Moorhead and Peoria about gravitational waves. 
Uh, one, do they get weaker with distance as light does? Mm -hmm. And two, do they reflect or refract on anything? Okay. Um, so, so the first answer is yes, they decrease with distance. So they decrease in strength with distance. Um, because of the way that we detect gravitational waves uh, compared to the way we detect light, you will often hear that light has a 1 over r squared dependence. That means if you get twice as far away from the source, it's only one quarter as bright. Okay, with gravitational waves, we have a slightly different quantity that we measure. And so gravitational waves fall off inversely as the distance. So if you get twice as far away, they are only half as weak. Okay, so there is a, di a, a, a distance dependence, but it's not as severe as the distance dependence with light. Okay, and then the second question was what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Do gravitational waves reflect or refract ah, on anything? Yes. As okay. Travel? So gravitational waves, um, they, they basically propagate through everything just like neutrinos do. When all of these gravitational wave events that you and I have been talking about strike the Earth, they pass right through me and you, and we don't even notice. Right? That's why we didn't even know they existed until Einstein's like, I wonder if these gravitational wave things exist. Right? They go right through us, and we don't even know. But they do experience gravity. So in particular, in the universe, there's a phenomena called gravitational lensing, where if I'm a little bundle of light and I'm traveling through the universe and I see a strong source of gravity over here, a cluster of galaxies, a bundle of dark matter, a black hole, the gravity from that object bends the trajectory that I'm traveling on. So after I pass it, I'm going in a different direction than I originally started on. Okay, and gravitational waves will do that exact same thing. So they will experience gravitational lensing in the same way that light does. Excellent. Uh, Rochester, Minnesota was curious if string theory plays into any of these uh, <laughs> forward thinking. So if you talk to your colleagues who do string theory, they will tell you, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, what I will say is that the frontiers of our understanding of gravity. Okay, so today we've been talking about detecting and confirming general relativity's predictions about the nature of black holes and gravitational waves. That's all what we call classical gravity. They are macroscopic effects made by macroscopic objects in the universe. But the frontiers of our understanding of gravity are about what happens to gravity on the most microscopic scales. Okay, so that's called quantum gravity. And your friends who are string, theory, uh, string theorists will tell you that string theory is the correct description of quantum gravity. Okay, well, maybe, maybe not. Okay, but there is one case that I think is an important one that I think about periodically where gravitational waves will help. And that is if you have read a little bit about string theory, they often talk about the idea that if string theory is true, the universe that you and I live in, the four-dimensional space and time that we live in, is only part of a much higher dimensional universe, that there are other dimensions that the strings connect to and stretch out into. And if that were true, we may, as our gravitational wave telescopes get more sensitive, be able to detect the fact that those dimensions exist. Because if the gravitational waves are propagating through the three space-time dimensions that you and I live, sorry, the four space-time dimensions that you and I live in, that they will also leak into those higher dimensions. And that loss of energy may be detectable. Okay, so if we could detect that, that loss in energy, it could provide credence to some of these higher dimensionality predictions of some string theories. Okay, we are far from having gravitational wave telescopes capable of doing that. It is plausible, but probably unlikely that Lisa could do it. Well, while we're on light and simple subjects, we'll wrap up with one more question from a student in Peoria. Uh, they're curious about your opinion on the Drake equation and the possibility <laughs> for intelligent life. So That's I have an entire another talk about the Drake equation. But let me tell you my favorite thing about the Drake equation. So for those of you who don't know the Drake equation, um, Frank Drake, who was one of the preeminent radio astronomers in the world uh, in 1950, he, th he wanted to know, could there be other planets in the Milky Way galaxy with life like us that had radio telescopes like ours that we could send signals back and forth to and have a conversation? Could we simulcast our Adler Dome lecture to a radio telescope somewhere else in the universe? 
And so he wrote down an equation that consisted of seven simple numbers that you can predict. Some of those numbers we know. How many stars are born in the Milky Way? How many planets are around every star? Those sorts of things. And then some of the numbers are numbers that we have to speculate about. On what fraction of planets is there organic material? On what fraction of planets does life become intelligent? And on what fraction of planets does life develop radio telescopes? Okay, so there are two camps of people who like that equation. One group of people, the optimists, will compute those numbers out, and they will tell you there are something like 10,000 uh, 10, planets in the galaxy that we could talk to. The pessimists will use the Drake equation and calculate it and say there is one planet <laughs> in the galaxy, <laughs> which is us. Okay? Okay. So what I like to do with the Drake equation is I like to take those seven numbers and throw two of them away, say I don't care about intelligent life and I don't care about life with radio telescopes, and replace one of the numbers, the length of time that life exists, with the length of time that dinosaurs lived on the Earth, okay? which was 275 million years. If you calculate the Drake equation with just those five numbers instead of all seven, what it is is it's a, an equation that predicts how many planets in the galaxy might have dinosaurs on it. Okay, <laughs> And that number is big. It's 10 million, which makes the 14-year-old inside of me very happy. <laughs> okay. Is that good enough? Okay. <laughs> let's call great. it a day. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, two, two quick notes. Um, if you remember, you saw the astrolabe on the dome there. If you're here in Chicago, you can actually get a close look at it if you exit uh, on the right side there. That's always on display here at the Adler Planetarium. Now, that object is more than 300 years old, one of the few times that people bothered to write down where those nova took place in the sky. But uh, the, re it, the story continues, uh, of course, from dinosaurs to astrolabes to today. Uh, we have even a better reason for you to come back here to the Adler Planetarium. In January, we'll be premiering our new dome show here in this space. It'll be called Imagine the Moon, and it's all about the moon in the sky and how it has always inspired human understanding and imagination through history and today and into the future. So with that, I'd like to once again thank the Kavli Foundation for the support for making this possible. Thank all of you for being here and all over the world, and thank Shane Larson. So I will have my Lisa Cube with me out.